All right, Romans 5 through 8 is where we are this morning. It is not only the high point of the letter of Romans, but it is also the solution to the problems between the weak and the strong in Rome. If the intent of this section is to provide us with a comprehensive, a broad view of, of how do you change in Christ in the Spirit, then Romans 7 is an important piece to that puzzle. It's an important chapter. If you're new or haven't been paying attention for the last, we've been in Romans uh, 13 weeks, the weak are Jewish believers. The strong are Gentile believers, and the weak are trying to get the strong to follow more of the Torah, more of the Old Testament law. Because if you're going to be a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, you know, you got to do the Old Testament. And so there's a tension between these two groups, and the solution to that tension is found in Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. Now, let's just suppose, and it's not that big of a supposition, that they had Sunday school in these house churches in Rome. And it was the week's turn to teach Sunday school. And so they get there, gather the children around. I think they would teach them this song. Father, I don't know how the motions start. Father Abraham has many sons. Many sons has Father Abraham. I am one of them, but you are not. So let's just get circumcised and eat kosher. <laughs> right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot. That's them. You're welcome. I've never had an invitation to the choir, although I was told the first day here what voice, whatever I was, a tenor, bass, soprano, whatever, she knew just by listening to my voice, that Joanna speaking voice. So whatever. I'm not joining the choir. <laughs> the weak taught that Jesus was good, but that you needed someone or something else to add to that. And the whole tenor of Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8 is what? They're lying. It's not true. You don't need Jesus plus anything. You don't need Jesus plus money. You just need Jesus. You don't need Jesus plus your husband to start making sense. It would be nice, but it is not necessary. You don't need Jesus plus that her to stop getting on my nerves. You don't need Jesus plus that acknowledgement that my career is going well and I'm doing a good job. You don't need Jesus plus a bigger house and a gated community with a lovely view. The wholeness and the worth of life rests solely on what Jesus has done for us. He's enough all by himself. And the whole section of Romans is answering the question, is it really enough to just believe? How are we transformed? How are we changed? And to answer, Paul's told us about the line of Adam and what it looks like to follow in his line and the line of Christ, of redemption. And it's the story about sin and obedience. It's the story about death and life and eternal life. It's the story of how do we solve these tensions in the church? If you're among the weak, your answer is we need more Torah. If you're among the strong or among Paul, it's all grace and spirit, he says. That's all you need. And in Romans 7, Paul uses a personal pronoun, I, more than he ever has in this book. Theologians have debated forever, who's the I? Is this the personal struggle of the Apostle Paul? Is this Adam? Is this Israel? Is this the line of Adam? Is it, is it Jewish believers? Is it the weak? The section does open, Romans 7, verse 1, with a caveat. He says, for I am speaking to those who know the law. Ooh, there's a hint. We often spend so much time trying to figure out who the I is that we miss the whole point of the section. 
Reading Romans backwards, I think, gives us a clue as to who the I is in Romans 7. Perhaps the I is that judge from Romans 2. Perhaps he's using it to, to represent the weak, the Jewish believers. And if that's true, then Paul is putting, into the, the, putting words into the mouth of the people. He's come across, these are arguments he's heard all across the empire as he's taught and people have come to Christ. You see, Paul would preach the gospel, Gentiles would come to faith, then Jewish believers or even non-Jewish, non-Jewish non-believers would confront these Gentile con- converts and say, you know, you got to add to the faith. And they argued that a full conversion to the God of Israel and the Messiah means you've got to obey the Torah, all of it, circumcision, food, holidays. And if they did do that as Gentiles, Uh, The result is Romans 7. This is what happens. The I passage becomes Paul's, I think, most complete argument against forcing the law, the Torah, on Gentile converts. Because if you do that, that path is not going to lead to righteousness. You don't become formed into the image of Christ by obeying the law. And I think we understand this text best if we follow Paul's train of thought. He asks two big questions in Romans 7. Question number one, does the law help us handle sin? Does the law really help me deal with sin? Big question number one. Big question number two, what happens when we try to add Torah to our spiritual lives? What happens when we try to take the law and and make it a, a factor in my spiritual growth? Now, here's a warning The outline gets a little convoluted as we move forward. Those are the two big questions. Don't lose sight of those two questions. Question one, does the law help me handle sin? Question two, what happens when we try to add the law into our spiritual lives? Okay, we're gonna go some other places on the sub points, but we're gonna come back to those two big questions. Here we go, question one, does the law help us handle sin? Paul's answer, yes and no. His answer actually is no and sort of yes in that order. He begins with no. Does the law help me handle sin? He says no. We must be freed from the law to handle sin. Romans 7 verses 1 through 6. We can't have Christ formed in us if we've got the law hanging over our heads. Because we are all aware we still have a problem. We still have sin. We still like sin. We still do sin. It's just we haven't learned how to handle the law. Is that the issue? Do we think regulations and detailed instructions about how to live are going to free us from our problems? Is that the solution? And deep down, I think we often say yes. And yet with the best of intentions, it doesn't work. Why? Because regulations will never create righteousness. If only health departments would realize you can't legislate and people are going to just submit and do what they want to, you want them to do. It doesn't work that way. We've got sin within us. Romans 7, 1. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, the weak, For I am, um, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. Obviously, once you die, what are you going to do? For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as she is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she's called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law And it's not an adulteress if she marries another man. Paul makes two statements to support his claim that the law is not going to help us. Number one, we died to the law. We died to it. You see, his point isn't that we just traded husbands. The law for Christ. The point is, 
We were in a bad marriage, and now we're in a good marriage. Under the law, we were in a relationship that would never satisfy us. It's like being married to the most demanding husband in the world. Nothing you do ever pleases him. Nothing is ever good enough. Nothing is ever clean enough. You work all day, fix a nice meal, but it's not perfect, so he doesn't like it. He's picky and demanding and perfectionistic, and he's critical. And the worst part, he's right all the time. Ugh. That's what it is like to live under the law. You know the law is good. It's right all the time. You do your best to live up to the Ten Commandments, but we're not perfect. We can't do this. Perfection, however, is what the law, the Torah, demands. You know, some grading on a curve. It's, you know, you break one, you've broken them all. It's not good enough to keep most of the commandments most of the time because the law will just condemn you and it will never make you look good. The point is, living under the law is like living with a perfect husband. You end up beaten down and discouraged and frustrated and you feel like a failure all the time. You can never be perfect enough, so sometimes you just give up trying. And yet some people still like to live under the law today. Even believers, how do I know? Oh, you know, it's not the Ten Commandments. We have our own Christian laws, you know? We have our own regulations. And we better follow them or else we're not a good Christian. What does it look like to still live under the law today? Three things. One, we're always proud of our record. You think you're, you like this law kind of thing? Well, examine your heart. Are you always proud of your record? Even though the law produces failure, we cover it up with our pride. When we experience defeat, we get people's attention off of our failures and onto our successes, and we say, oh, you know, forget that, but look at me, I'm doing this. I'm proud of my record. And we point out an area of success, and we boast how well we're doing. Let me ask you, do you ever come up for prayer after church? If not, why not? Don't you ever need prayer? Ever? You might not. But make sure it's because it's not that you're too proud to admit a need. Because one of the first marks of a person who's living under rules and regulation Christianity is always that they're pointing out how good they're doing. I'm good. I'm good. I don't need anything. We're always proud of our record. Second mark, we're always critical of others. It's a diversionary tactic. Why are people so critical of other people? Well, if you succeed in getting your friend's eyes fo focused on somebody else, then they're not looking at you. And we're justified because, you know, we point out faults in other people. I don't do those things, aren't I good? And we criticize in others the very things that actually we're guilty of ourselves. And we don't even know it. You see, living by a sense of rule and regulation produces a sense of failure and defeat. And we're going to compensate by that, compensate that by criticizing other people. Third, I refuse to admit any error. Never wrong. And if you live under the law, you're always reluctant to admit any error in your own life. They say that was one of Richard Nixon's problems. He could never admit he was wrong. Chuck Colson wrote about him once that he obviously had a cold, the symptoms, the nose, the everything, but he never would admit it. No, I don't have a cold. See, that's the mentality of those living under rule and regulation Christianity. They feel very heavily the standard of conduct. Of conduct. They gotta meet it. And so they pretend they're living up to it even though they're not. Because if I admit defeat, that means I gotta change. I gotta do something different. Paul says, we died to the law. Second, in, in verses four through six, he says, we are now married to Christ. Verse four. 
So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us, so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law, so that we serve in the new way, in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. All right, well, there we are, he says. We're married to Christ. When we died to the law, that ended our marriage to the law because death ends all contracts. And so having died to the law, we're now married to Christ. Like trading this demanding husband for one who's always loving, forgiving, and encouraging, and accepting. It is the exact opposite of that first husband. And the amazing thing, he's perfect too. And he never makes us feel bad for our lack of perfection. He just takes you just as you are and he actually makes you a better person as you spend time with him. Because before you came to Christ, you were in a losing relationship with the law. But now that you've entered a winning relationship to, with Jesus, the law, it made you a loser, but now you're a winner with him. And the law, what it really did was actually raise those, those bad passions within you. It said, do this. Hmm. And we don't do that. We do what we want to do. It said, don't do that. Ah, okay, I'll do it. And you got this inner spiritual death going on. And we died a little bit more every day when you're under the law. But now through Jesus Christ, we actually have a, a teeny bit of a desire to do what's right. Because you're joined with him. You're married to him. You've got this vital living relationship with him. And he now lives through us. And the places in our lives that were marked out as failure, they don't have to be failure anymore. They can be sources of triumph. Did you notice in verse 4, he says, you are the one who died. The law didn't die. You did. And he turns this illustration on its head, the supposing that you, not the husband, died. You die and are brought back to life, and you marry a second husband. That throws the illustration for a loop. We died to the law. It no longer has any controlling power over us. We're dead to it. So we don't need this slavish obedience to some written code. We serve God in the new way of the Spirit. Does the law then help us handle sin? No, he says. But then he says yes. If we learn from it. And if in that learning we begin to run to Christ. We must learn from the law, and we must run to Christ, verses 7 through 14. One of the most influential writers of the 20th century was Carl Menninger. He wrote a lot of influential books, but probably the one that, that has influenced culture the most is the book entitled, Whatever Became of Sin. And in this book, he says this, the very word sin which seems to have disappeared was a proud word. It was once a strong word, an ominous and serious word. It described a central point in every civilized human being's life plan and lifestyle. But the word went away. It's almost disappeared. The word along with the notion. Why? Doesn't anyone sin anymore? Doesn't anyone believe in sin anymore? And the whole premise of his book is to trace the disappearance of the concept of sin in our culture. He argues that in place of the historic concept of sin, what do we talk about now? We talk about crime. We talk about symptoms. And he says if you discard the concept of sin and replace it with the concept of symptoms... You've defined it as something that's completely outside of us, not within us. But that's not Paul's definition of sin. And so his, the argument then is, therefore, we need, Paul's argument is, we need the Torah. We need the law. 
Because it's in the law we discover four realities about sin. Number one, the law reveals the fact of sin. It's there. Verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Well, certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except for the law. For I would not know what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. You see, the law tells us the difference between right and wrong. Second, the law reveals the power of sin. Verse 8, but sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every type of covetous desire. It said, don't do it. And I learned what it was, and now that's all I want to do. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I wouldn't have known. Once I was alive apart from the law. When the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment was, that was intended to bring life actually brought death. He says, verse 8, seize the opportunity. At the end of verse 9, he says, sin sprang to life. They're, they're military terms. It's, they, it, sin ambushed me. That's the power of sin. Third, he says, the law reveals the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 11, for sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me. And through the commandment, put me to death. Sin deceives us. And if, if you can learn anything helpful from this message, you ought to learn this. Sin always deceives. Always. Sin says, go ahead. It'll be fun. What happens in Vegas, it stays in Vegas. It says, go ahead, enjoy it. It says, well, all those consequences, they'll happen to other people. They're not going to happen to you. It reveals the deceitfulness of sin. Fourth, the law reveals the sinfulness of sin. Verse 12, so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good become death to me? Well, by no means, but in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. He says the law takes this concept of sin, and from being sin with a small case S, it makes it sin with a capital S. And Paul's, Paul's point is clear. The law isn't bad. The Ten Commandments, they're good. The law is holy and righteous and good, but the law is like a mirror. When you stand before a mirror, what do you see? You see yourself. Mirror doesn't lie. It's like a person who doesn't like what he sees in the mirror, so he takes his shoe off and he, you know, he bashes the mirror. Well, that's going to help. That's what people do with the law. The problem isn't the mirror. The problem is you, and that's the point. So question one, remember, two questions. Question one, does the law help us handle sin? Well, yes, if you use the law to help, to, to teach you to run to Christ. But does the law help to handle sin? No, because you really need to be freed from it to handle sin. It's just going to reveal it. It's not going to deal with it. You're not going to solve the tensions in the house churches of Rome by adding the law to the requirements for behavior. So question number two, big question number two, what do we discover if we add Torah to our walk with Jesus? What if you do do that? What if you do make some requirements? What happens then? Because if you're going to say that Jesus isn't enough and you need to add the Torah, what's going to happen? If you listen to the weak who are saying more Torah, what's life going to look like? If I could say it in one word, life is going to look like this. Struggle. Conflict. War. If you add Torah to the faith, you're going to have a struggle. You're going to have a conflict. You're going to experience warfare in your life and in the church. Why? Because the problem is not simply sin on the outside. 
The problem we have to face is sin on the inside. The problem is not simply temptation out there, but temptation in here. For all of us as believers in Jesus Christ, sin is not something that is just outside of us. Sin is something we have to wrestle with within us every single day of our lives. Why? Why is there a struggle inside of every believer? Well, the answer is very simple, and it is two words, indwelling sin. Look at the text. Paul says it very plainly, verse 17. As it is no longer I myself doing it, but it is sin living in me. Sin lives in me. He uses the same phrase in verse 20, sin living in me. Sin dwells, it lives inside of the life of everyone, even believers. And Paul says that sin is actually present in the members of our bodies. He says that whenever we want to do good, there's evil right there within me. And as long as you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you will never be completely free of that indwelling sin. It's that pull inside you. And as long as you're in a mortal body, you're going to have that pull. Verse 24 says, the weak cry out, I think, in desperation, what a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. Have you ever thought that, that perhaps sin is the reason your body grows old? Sin is the reason your body decays. Sin is the reason you die. There's a sin principle working with inside your body. And in this passage, Paul lays bare the struggle with, with, with the mind that's been liberated by Christ, which knows the indwelling Savior. And this principle, however, that sin dwells within me. And what Paul is saying is that there's a war going on inside the heart of everybody who follows Christ. It's a struggle that goes on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, in and out. And nobody ever gets to the place where they say, oh, I'm not going to struggle with sin anymore. The war's over. If you try to add Torah to the Christian life, you're going to struggle. If you want to add rules and regulations, you're going to struggle because sin dwells within you and rules never make you righteous. So where's my hope? How do I have Christ formed within me? If it's not doing this list of things, what is it? What will help us in our struggle with sin? I think Paul suggests three things in, in 24 that's going to expand in, in chapter 8. And you'll, we'll, we'll cover that even more as we move forward. But this is a place to begin. He says there's three parts to help you struggle with sin. Number one, you need honesty. Verse 24, what a wretched man I am. That's a Christian talking. I think it's a weak believer trying to, to manage the law and this faith. And the conclusion is what a wretched man I am. Apart from Jesus Christ and apart from what the Holy Spirit wants to do within our lives, what a wretched man I am. You've heard the expression before, you know the truth and the truth will set you free. But first, it will hurt you because it's the truth. And the reason many of us never grow as believers is because we hear the truth intellectually, but we never hear it enough to actually let it hurt us. It comes in, we put up our deflector shields, and it bounces harmlessly away. We're good at deflecting truth because the truth will hurt. And the truth never really changes us because we don't let it get close enough to hurt. Honesty, first step. Admit your true condition, O oh, wretched man or woman that I am. Part two, humility. Verse 24, the last half. Who will rescue me 
from this body of death. And the difference between honesty and humility is this. Honesty says, I'm a wretched man. Humility says, I can't save myself. I can't do this. As far as I know, there's only three things you can do with your sin. You can deny it. A lot of people do that. You can try to deal with it on your own. Well, that works well, right? Or you can admit it. You can turn to God, seek his forgiveness, and find it. Honesty, humility, but where's the hope? Where's the power? It's here. And I think it's here, we, we just miss it sometimes. Verse 25, complete dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The answer's right there. All of chapter eight is contained in that one small statement. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's the provision for victory. It's not adding Torah to Jesus. There's the provision for victory. It's not, you know, getting a better husband. There's the provision for victory. It's not getting kudos on our career. It's not living in a better house or getting that vacation home. There's a provision. It's walking in the Spirit. It's through Jesus Christ. There's how you win the struggle with sin. It's right there. It's not a formula. It's a person. It's something on the it's not something on the outside of us. It's something within. It's a moment by moment dependence on Christ and realizing his power is enough to rescue us. You don't have to be defeated, though sometimes you will be. You don't have to stay in the muck and the mire, though sometimes you're going to wake up there. The complete dependence on Jesus Christ, with that there's the possibility of significant growth and victory in your life. The answer to everything he's just said about his struggle is thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You cannot experience the kind of power you need to defeat sin until you come to the end of yourself and stop striving. Stop trying to add some rules and regulations to the Christian life. You cannot experience power to change until you're done changing on your own. That's why the words of 724 are so difficult to say because we have to fully understand I'm the problem. I'm the reason that Christ is not seen by other people in me. And until we stop trying to live by the rules of Christianity, until we stop trying to live the Christian life on our own and let Christ live his life through us, we're just going to be exhausted. This is a desperate cry in Romans 7. And the answer is ultimately Jesus Christ. He's the only one who's ever lived this thing successfully. And our only hope is to get the law out of the way and let him live his life through us. And until we realize that, there's absolutely nothing within us. We do not have enough strength we don't have a smidgen of anything, a thimbleful to add to this equation. We're going to fail in the process of change. And you say, how'd you get all that from Romans 7, 25? Well, have you read the rest of the New Testament? Romans 5, 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more being reconciled shall we be saved by his life? Saved there, it doesn't mean forgiven in this context. It means saved from, from, from the power of sin, not the penalty of sin. You could paraphrase it like this, having been forgiven through his death, you are now being changed by his life. Christ living through me. Second Corinthians 4, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. That's an encouraging verse, is it not? All the hope and the power, yea, God. But you got to read the next verse. Verse 10, 
always carrying around about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our body. When you see spiritual energy in somebody else, whose is it? It's Christ's, not ours. It's not me at all. It's Christ living through me. Verse 11, for we who live are always delivered to, death's, delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. You see something worthwhile going on in your body, your shell, if there's anything eternal and lasting, that's the life of Christ flowing through you. Jesus is enough. Jesus will transform our lives. Christ in me. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. This is the dead part. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. When we believe that Jesus could keep his promise to forgive our sin and give us eternal life, he came to live within us. He's there. He's enough. That is the life of the Christian. Not I, but Christ. Not Torah, but Jesus. Romans 8.2 says, Because through Jesus Christ, the law of the Spirit gives, who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. The weak, the judge, or the I in Romans 7, and the strong, you're free from living under Torah. You can live by grace. That doesn't mean you can live like hell and not worry about it. It's not what that means. Paul's vision is that Christ has done for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He's died our death, and we've died with him and put to death the flesh. And the purpose of the law, the Torah, was to turn Israel into fleshly Israel so they could see the nature of their sin. But the purpose of Christ is to destroy sin. Verse 4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In other words, grace to us through Christ in the Spirit, it affects a transformation that's gracious and beautiful into something even beyond what, what living the law could possibly do. See, now it is time to live your theology, not obey a set of rules. You can eat dinner with someone in church, someone in church who voted for whoever in the last election, the person you didn't vote for. You can have dinner with them if you live your theology, not go by rules and regulations. We can welcome each other when we disagree. For you see, the church is at its best when broken people in need of grace are helping and loving other broken people in need of grace. Living our theology. You're not going to be transformed by doing the Torah because it was designed to reveal sin, not deal with sin. The transformation the judge has learned is not the way of Torah, but the way of grace through the Spirit. That, to me, is the argument of Romans 7. Oh, wretched man that I am. Let's pray. Father, your word is rich. Your word gives life. We don't want to be rule and regulation believers. We want to be a source of grace and hope and love. We want to be a group of folks who live out our theology, not just obey our theology, but live it. That we might sense in you just the impact we can have on the world. Be that, that blessing that you've promised to be. In Jesus' name, amen.